Welcome, metalheads. I'm the host of Heavy Metal Philosophy and writer for Metal Digest, John Barbus. I've got a great episode for you this week. I've got the writer and musician Tom Coles, who wrote the book on death metal. Literally, he wrote a book called Death Metal, a comprehensive book about our favorite music. And if you're a listener to this podcast, that means you're not just a metalhead, but you're also well-read and very intelligent. So if you're into books like I am, and you're into metal like I am, check this one out. It was a fun conversation, and brilliant people like you will stick around to the end for this week's Riff of the Week. As always, without further delay, here's Tom Coles. Sure. Tom, it's great to finally talk to you. We've been messaging for a while now. We are at the eve of the release of your new book, aptly titled Death Metal, with a beautiful pink cover. <laughs> I love it, man. Thank I can't you. I can't wait to read it. I wish I could have read it before now, but it'll get here soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it really is a striking cover. I, um, I, I went to a Damnation Festival in the UK um, last weekend, um, and I saw someone had a whole row of, um, you know, like, Rotting Waste and Misery and, um, like, Choosing Death and all the really big, exciting death metal books, and they all have really grim, like, black, um, grey covers. I just think... I think my... <laughs> I just, I'm excited to see, like, the contrast of the, the like... Barbie Dreamhurst pink, uh, in uh, yeah. yeah, in contrast to that, exciting. So on my weekend show, I always do the album art of the week, and and I always pick album art that really stands out from all the rest, and it makes me curious to, hey, what's in this thing? So I think you'll probably accomplish that with this cover. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. I mean, yeah, I'm excited. So what made you want to write a book about death metal? Um, so I the actual sort of process of it was um, I pitched. Um, uh so third three and third do um like individual albums uh, i pitched over um the napalm death album from from enslavement to obliteration uh and they got in touch and said like we did like it but we couldn't include it it was probably a pit niche uh thinking about it that's just fair enough um uh and then yeah they said like we're doing a new series do you want to do um do you want to take some of that research and do it in a in a different format uh i said yeah definitely um I picked Death Metal because um, a because I'd already done like a lot of research, a lot of reading around around Napalm Death, um, so I had a lot of that um, like already sort of um, like fresh in my brain. Um, but also because like Death Metal for me um, was something I got into uh, pretty young. I was sort of twelve, thirteen, and I remember specifically it was the point where I was just starting to listen to music and I couldn't really, I was struggling to explain why I liked it. Um, people, there's, there's stories in the book, like people, um, my friends would say like, why, why do you like this awful stuff? And um, I definitely did like it. I just, I couldn't really explain, you know, why I, why I enjoyed it. I was really sort of, it was having that sort of tension and that difficulty in explaining why that appeals to me and why I was listening to Cannibal Corpse and not um, uh, like Blink-182 or whatever. Um, was the kind of thing that sort of set, set me on the path of write, wanting to write about music and wanting to communicate what it was about music that appealed to people. Um, so yeah, I owe it a lot because it, it is the thing that got me into writing about music in general. And I do, I do really, really love the music. Um, I still, I still, I'm a really, really big fan to this day. So you were already writing for a publication, and and then they asked you to do this. Yeah, so um, I, I've written for Terrorizer. I'm currently writing for Zero Tolerance. Uh, I've done a few bits with the choirs, this cult nation, that kind of thing. Um, and then, like, my goal was to, like, write a book about um, heavy music in some way. Um, so I, I kept pitching stuff to 33 and 3rd um, in, in the hopes that uh, I'd be able to get on their radar and eventually, eventually was, was able to. Very good. Well, again, I'm very much looking forward to reading it. Uh, in your, like, what, is it like a story or is it like a historical book? Or, set it up for me. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of both. It's, um, it starts from, it, it's, it's a succinct history of death metal, um, okay. hitting all the sort of, sort of big points, 160 pages, uh, for a movement that's been going on for about 40 years. It's not, not very many pages to sort of capture all of that. Um, but it goes right from, um, uh, setting up sort of like setting up all the venom stuff, uh, you know, Sodom, all the sort of like really dark energies that were happening. Um, 
in order to kind of take trading that explains how it sort of spread out really quickly. Um, so all the stuff from the kind of um, 70s, early 80s to the mid 80s with people like Possessed um, and early death records and things, um, all the way up to, um, I say modern day, I mean, it was sort of, I think 2021 is the latest, because um, that's when I handed the, um, the manuscript in, um, that we sort of up to the, the time of, of writing. Um, and it's a, it's a history sort of first and foremost of what happened when, um, but it's also, um, it's also a study of, um, why it's been so popular and why, why do we have, um, why, you know, A, why are people like possessed still going, why are cannibal corpse still going? Um, but also why do we have things like gate creeper and, um, uh venom prison that kind of thing uh you know why has death metal um stayed so fascinating to people that it's really being practiced in a very similar form uh in, from from the early 80s uh, as it is as it is now so yeah it's a kind of it's a combination of a lot of things i spoke to a lot of um i spoke to a lot of bands but i also spoke to a lot of um journalists academics um philosophers um sociologists uh, that kind of thing to sort of get to grips with why death metal is so important why death metal has that kind of staying power and to discuss like the death growl and what the death growl does um so yeah it's 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 a sort of combination of a lot of things it makes it quite a fun story to tell uh, I mean, and it's not me, just a list event that makes me even more excited to read it uh in your research Mm -hmm. you know starting from the beginning coming up to now which i consider like the last i don't know two or three years to be like a renaissance in death metal mm -hmm. you know, those bands you mentioned gate creeper venom prison mm -hmm. uh 200 stab wounds you know these guys really carrying the flag into the next generation in your research from the the ogs to now the, was there anything that you found surprising or like a cool anecdote you're like oh i didn't know that that happened um there are a bunch of things uh a cool anecdote um chris from autopsy <laughs> they they had a check through to do their first album this is all in the book and uh, they had a check through to do their first album uh and they <laughs> spent half of it on weed and then had to record it really quickly as you do um yeah as you do yeah Re relatable content but um yeah <laughs> that stuck out to me because it was just a fantastic story um i think um I was interested, like the um, speaking to the new bands who are doing the. I mean, Venom Prison aren't so much doing the old school death metal thing, but I spoke to Chase from Gate Creeper, um, and I wasn't quite sure, like, um, what kind of attitude he was going to go. I, I figured um, for a lot of those guys, like, I wonder that they're just you know, doing death metal because they really love it. But he was like super up on like. Um, he was a really, really interesting guy because he had really broad music taste uh, and like really, really knowledgeable about a whole bunch of different things, um, uh, espe especially um, kind of death metal stuff. Um, and we spent ages talking about like, um, he just knows death metal really, really well, like into the real specific details. So we had a really long, really in-depth conversation. I was, it was one of those ones where I wasn't quite sure what I was going to get out. And then we had a really, really fascinating chat. Um, I wish I could have quoted more of him in the book. Um, but yeah, he was... I guess not surprising, but like we, I wasn't sure what I was going to get out. You know, you speak to some people and they're like, you know, I, I sort of, you, you know, the history of, um, of uh, Napalm Death, that kind of thing. Um, you sort of know what to expect from, from interviewing them. Um, but the more, um, the people I spoke to who were in uh, bands that sort of popped up in the past few years, um, had a really interesting take on things. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like, the ogs you know the cannibal mm -hmm. corpses and and immolation and those guys mm -hmm. you know they were right on the cutting edge so mm -hmm. if you were going to ask them about death metal you know like they're not really going to have that historical context because they were the beginning you know but mm -hmm. these new bands they're going to be scholars of what got them to where they're at today mm -hmm. and, and absolutely yeah 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 it's like the the genre is is now becoming mature so now you know there's there's expectations and then there's also um you know people pushing the edge of of what it means to be in death metal venom prison's a great example mm -hmm. of that because it's it's not old school death metal it's got a lot of that modern sensibility to it yeah definitely definitely um it's interesting um because sometimes the needle sort of comes back the other way and we get people doing fairly you know venom prison uh Gate Creeper is a good example of like a fairly sort of 
on the on the sort of face of it like by the books death metal band but also right. like if you listen to them like they're so good like um and not just like i think like they do that thing where like not an inch of space is wasted um you know it's it's all sort of like they know exactly what makes a death metal song tick um right. and everything is like precision engineered to be the best goddamn like death metal like um the best goddamn death metal like collection of death metal songs they possibly can be um it's really interesting to see someone like okay we'll do like fairly straight death metal but we'll just like do it like we'll just do it we'll just completely finesse it um so it's interesting to see those attitudes sort of come through as well i mean there's all kinds of modern death metal in a, you said it was a, a renaissance i completely agree it's in a fantastic place um blood uh blood um blood incantation um imperial triumphant um yeah i mean like this this um ulcerate that kind of thing like bands who are really on the sort of like on the sort of fringes of um right. experimental music like exploring that through some kind of death metal um process but then the genre is so mature you have like revival death metal bands like gate creeper or 200 mm -hmm. stab wounds or like that yeah, we're old school death metal it's mm -hmm. like a celebration of the genre yeah definitely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um two mold or another one um yeah. yeah and we're also seeing um <laughs> We're also seeing laser styles um, have the same kind of like be part of the same cycle. So we're seeing, you know, Lorna Shaw coming back and doing like OG deathcore um, with their own spin on it. Yeah. Uh, how long did you take uh, doing the research and then the writing? I think um, I had a bit of a step up for the research because I'm a big nerd. And I like I had a lot. Of, <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of books already. <laughs> um, I you know, had like seen the yeah, the carcass documentaries and and that kind of thing, and um, just had to go back and like a lot of it I had to just go back and refresh. Um, um, so the research was, I think probably probably like maybe sort of two or three months um, of the of the process, and I was already sort of like I kind of I tend to do everything all at once. I set out and make a big plan to sort of like um, compartmentalize everything, but in reality, I'm always like. Um, I've always tried to, I always had to stand up doing everything all at once. So it was about sort of two or three months of, um, reading books, rewatching documentaries, um, and then like interviewing people. And, um, as I'm sort of like going through early sort of like real, 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 like rough skeletal drafts going like, okay, well, we need to talk to some desk core bands here. Um, we need to talk to some producers here. We need to talk to your journalists here and people who make things happen here. Um, so yeah, roughly two or three months for the research phase. And then the overall, I think the overall writing was just over, just over a year. Um, maybe sort of like 13 months. Um, and then the editing phase was a couple of months. Uh, and then proofreading was a little bit after that. The whole process from um, signing the contract to it being out was about two years. Wow. George R. R. Martin says that there's two kinds of writers. There's an architect, and a gardener so you know an architect plans it out and then builds you know the frame and then puts all the trim around it and a gardener is just like okay let's see what happens uh, how would you consider yourself with this book um i think like there's a part there's me in like a parallel universe um where like my brain developed differently or whatever where i am definitely an architect um i definitely set out with like architect intentions i'm definitely not you know um I think I can, um, I'm definitely more of a gardener. Um, <laughs> I think um, it's, it, um, it takes a real special commitment um, and focus and discipline to really kind of be, be an architect and really sort of follow a path once you, once you've set it. Um, I've written, I've been writing for quite a long time. So I do have like, I just have like a reasonable, like self-discipline for that sort of thing. Um, but I think like at the heart of it, like once I've followed a plan for a little bit, I'm definitely like definitely a gardener. Um, but it, the, the downside with being a gardener is you tend to sort of, um, I, I t certainly tend to like sort of fall off the rails a bit and um, go off in those wild directions. It's very difficult to present a coherent piece if you are like that. Um, so yeah, yeah. over the years I've trained myself to be like um, more together with, with projects like that but yeah at, at the heart of things i'm definitely a gardener and a lot of gardening went into this book so while you were gardening did any of the things sprout up and you go oh okay well i wasn't expecting that this was cool um 
I think the um I think the sort of shape of it, I definitely sort of the shape of the story and the kind of the story you're telling, um that definitely sort of um that definitely kind of changed a bit, like where like it's weird to think about it like story beats. You're essentially you're, you're, you want it to be you want a history like this to be really engaging. So you've got to sort of plan out like um, s story beats almost. So you know like it, it did really well here, and here's where like here's where the climax of the story comes in. A big climax is, for example, like Death Metal does really well commercially. It looks like it's you know all this work is finally going to pay off, and um, completely against the odds again, you do really well and all the carcass stuff happens and um the money like very quickly drains out of death metal um i think that for me the um that when i was writing it like the those kind of story beats changed around a bit it's, it's a weird thing to sort of um sort of comprehend because like in in a you're also telling a story a story that happened and doesn't always sort of the real life doesn't tell a perfect story um so it's it's a weird thing to get your your head around um so yeah i i think that ended up changing quite a bit um for like how i would like communicate that story to no one to someone who who hadn't really was curious morbidly but didn't really know much about death metal that's interesting so you know for like a fiction writer per se you know mm -hmm. you got a story and it's always very difficult to end the story you know, it's one of the hardest things in the world to have a, a satisfying ending. But meanwhile, you're writing nonfiction and the story is not over yet. So I wonder is like, is it harder to end this nonfiction work with a satisfying ending that, you know, there's no prime mover saying this is the way the story is going. It's just mm -hmm. life unfolding. Yeah, um, it sort of ends with um, it's actually really nice. The, the um and really conveniently for me, um, the the part the the time we've got to with Death Metal, um, I was lucky to be able to interview um, Gate Creeper and Venom Prison to have like a bit of a to chat about like where Death Metal was now. A lot, as, as we've said like a couple of times, a lot of those old ideas are sort of coming back to roost um, and are coming back to um, coming back into prominence. So it's it was, I think I ended up. Uh, the way it was sort of structured, it's like the ending, the one, the, yeah, the, the last like big chapter um, is coming back, and um, yeah, it's saying like it's it's still here and it's still going, and people are still people are still making it, um, and it's still really really popular. And uh, not only that, but it's like having a renaissance at the moment. Um, so it's really interesting to sort of bring some of those those ideas I discussed really early on um, back into into the story. So that was like a really nice way to sort of cap it off. Um, I mean, there have been other times where um, I really like um, I really like choosing death. The book, the um, the uh, sort of bible from kind of the early two thousands. Um, and one of the things about like that um, is, yeah, it's written. I think it was published in I think two thousand four. Uh, and at that point, that's at the end of Death Metal having its time in the sun. And you still get great bands like Nile and Akakoka and that kind of thing, and Opeth is coming through. So there's still hope for all that. Um, but also, you know, it's it's before um, you know before Deathcore sort of takes off. It's like a few years before that kind of um, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Um, MySpace fueled infusion. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting for me to see, to um, to end the story there, where we're starting to see um, those ideas start to sort of come up and bloom again. Mm, so it's just fortuitous the timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, very cool. Uh, so we're. Obviously, you have to take you have to talk about the uh, satanic panic of the '90s, <laughs> and then you mentioned the the whole carcass stuff. Was there any other uh, like big genre defining historical events that you covered in this? Sure. Um, so I I'm really interested in yeah. So that's that's covered. The um, Eric raids uh, are covered. Um, um, I think what's interesting for me is um, where. And this is covered like quite a lot through the book. Is where um, uh, death metal kind of bleeds through into the mainstream a little bit. So you have things like um, you have things like um, uh, you know Phoebe makes a joke about it in Carcass and in, um, in Friends um, about like Carcass. Um, uh, Carcass are in Red Dwarf, um, the sci-fi show. Um, 
and also uh, and things like um, the uh, Ace Ventura film. Uh, in the UK, there was a, an interview with um, uh, Ed Miliband, who was the um, at one point like leader of the opposition um, and nearly became prime minister. Um, he he had um, he had Barney from Napalm Death on his show. Um, so I cover I, uh, other things like um, the, the, the extreme noise terror over uh, on the Brits with the KLF. Um, uh, they, uh, you suffer pops up in um, in TV shows occasionally. Um, all those kind of things where um, this sort of strange underground thing sort of pops up in um, in mainstream culture. I'm so I'm quite interested in that. So they they popped up quite. Um, so those are those little historical moments are covered quite a bit. It's a really good. The really interesting and compelling stories to get people in, like this sort of strange shadow world that exists, um, <laughs> you know, outside of the realm of culture, it's like popping up occasionally. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think that's a very, if you're talking to people who don't know a lot about death metal, um, it's a really interesting way to, um, yeah, to, to frame death metal as something that's still happening. People are really, really passionate about. You talked about it at the beginning that you can't explain to your friends why you like death metal so much. It's funny because that is the very reason that changed my mind about that whole eons old debate is, do we all have free will or is it all determined? Mm -hmm. And I used to be staunchly in the camp of free will, but that whole not being able to explain why, why I like death metal so much it kind of sort of changed my mind a little bit. It's like, oh, maybe it is all determined because looking back, I had no choice in the matter whatsoever about being a metalhead. Mm -hmm. At no point did I just decide like, you know what? I'm going to be into this really abrasive genre of music that nobody else likes. It's just the first time I heard Metallica, I was like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> it's over. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, in that struggle to explain to your friends why you like this, have you thought about like, do you have a choice in the matter about being a metalhead? It's really interesting. Um, I guess, I guess not so much. Like, but I, I also I had a similar thing as a kid where um, this this story is in the in the book as well. Um, I we we had a substitute music teacher um, who played us like we it was some kind of like history of music um, thing. And uh, he played us Cannibal Corpse as a joke. I remember everyone sort of like recoiling in horror and me thinking like, oh, this is yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. Um, and I was obviously like right when LimeWire was um, was big. So I ended up downloading the Cannibal Corpse discography. I'm so sorry, Cannibal Corpse. I have bought it all since then. Um, that's, that's interesting. I think um, I always, because it's such a weird thing. I, ne I never sort of like... I will. Ex I can explain now, obviously, why I like it and why it's sort of um, why it's very special to me. Um, but I've always kind of been like, look, if you don't, if you don't like it, it's, it, it's fine. That it's just not for you. Like, it's a very, it's a very ugly form of music, um, and there's no obligation to like it. Um, I think it can sort of. I've, I've got a lot of friends. Obviously, I've been like a big out outspoken metal fan for quite a long time, and a lot of my friends who are just not into metal at all have, start, have sort of come around to going okay no there is there is something there um i don't have a, i don't have a like a, a straight answer to, an answer for that i think people can um i think people can come around to it but i think there's also i think i don't think it's the same as having a, a viscerally um positive uh like like gut positive feeling to something like that i think um yeah 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 yeah, I, that's, I think that's the right way to put it because, mm. uh, you know, back in the late 90s, all of our friends would have like a copy of Metallica's Black Album. You know, there'd mm -hmm. be like one or two songs that everybody, okay. But, mm -hmm. you know, nobody had a copy of Cannibal Corpse. Like I mm -hmm. was the only yeah. one, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I was definitely the only one with an immolation CD, you know. So it, it it grabbed me in a in a in a much stronger way, mm -hmm. and you know also right beside their black album CD they'd have like like you said like Blink One Eighty Two or mm -hmm. you know Green Day or something I didn't none of that I hated that, and and as as much as uh, metal grabbed a hold of me I also had no choice about liking that kind of music I couldn't like at a party like okay I'm just gonna I'm just gonna enjoy this with everybody else like I couldn't do it you know I. As I've matured, like you said, I've realized, oh, it's just not for me. But back then, I was like, I hate this. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, totally. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was very try. I'm not sure tribal is the right word. Like, I, I know it's been used quite a lot. But I did feel like sort of like, um, you know, if, if you if you if you like if you if you're a metal guy, then you don't like the other thing. I did like a lot of that stuff. I, I for me, it was um, the sort of like early two thousands um, like indie music indie scene. I remember at the time being like completely like like mind-numbingly bored by the whole thing i think yeah. now i go back and there, there is like there is some stuff i enjoy um there was some really good stuff there but it was um the whole market was like flooded very quickly by um indie bands who would like sell a couple of records and then be like maybe we like like good for like one album cycle and then were and then like one festival cycle and then were dumped by the label or like maybe had a couple of albums in them um I think I, I just yeah, it just did nothing for me at all. I was really, really like deeply um, looking for something um, that would hit me. I like music. But I, I wanted something to hit me on a like more visceral level, and Death Metal absolutely did. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think um, one that one of the one of the frustrating things is um, it's a genre that really lends itself to doing research and like learning and history of it. Obviously, when you do that, you want to share that with other people and like discuss it with them. If there's no one around you who cares about that kind of thing in the same way that you do, it's um, it's it's very it's quite it's quite vexing, quite annoying. You really want to seek out that kind of community that likes this very strange, obscure, dark thing that you're that you're into. Yeah, uh, David Burke and I talked about that. It's like metalheads mm -hmm. know the history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They know what separates all the different genres and stuff. You know, pop fans, you know, it's just disposable. It's, I just like the beat. You know, they, they, there's no need whatsoever to know the history of pop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because, you know, as adverse as I was to pop back then, I actually like a lot of pop nowadays because pop is going through its own sort of revival where you've got uh, bands that are, are doing throwback to the old R and B, which I do consider, you know, great, meaningful, organic music. You got like the weekend and Bruno Mars making, mm -hmm. you know, it's pop music, but it's deeply rooted in like blues and R and B, which, you know, to me is a more meaningful style of music. Yeah, sure. Um, to be honest, like I, I like a lot of pop music now. Um, I did, I did like some of the, uh, the pop music back then. I, I've, I sort of slagged off Blink One Eight Two um, back um, in earlier in the interview, and like I, I think I would publicly at the time have said I wasn't a fan. But I did, I did like a couple of songs. Um, <laughs> I, I, I quite like. I am, um, you know, I am. Um, I like a lot of pop music now. I listen to a lot of pop music now. Um, I think I, yeah, I even the kind of. Um, I think there's space for, um, in my taste, and there's space generally for, like, real meaningless pop music, real sort of, like, like no, like, you know, I, I, I couldn't justify why I enjoy it. I just, like, just the sort of, like, sugary dopamine hits, um, like, hits me in the right way. Um, I think there's, um, yeah, I, I have no issue with that kind of thing. I've, um, I went through a long phase of being very like specific about what I like, so I could like try and justify everything I like. I'm just not bothered about that now. I, I will just listen to like I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy with like garbage. Um, yeah, like 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 um, party music. Yeah, 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 party music exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that you've written a book, do you did you like the process? Do you think you want to write more? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, I'm very keen. I I've wanted to be a writer since I was about um probably about like five or six. Like I, it's like very early memory. Um, I, I remember specifically thinking that I wanted to do that. Um, and now I've done that. I'm very hungry to to write some more. Um, I have over the past couple of months pitched a couple of books to um to people. Uh, one about music, one about um something else, which I can't go into just yet. Uh, and if they get picked up, I will yeah hopefully continue with stuff. Um. I'd like to write fiction. I'd like to write um, sort of young adult fiction, that kind of thing. Um, I think once I've done that, like I, I tend to, I tend to like scratch an itch and then move on to something new. So I imagine I'll do that um, and then do do something different. Um, I'd love to write some science fiction at some point. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you're already a published journalist. Is, <laughs> is there, is it, are there any comparisons to the feeling you got when you first got your first writing gig as a, you know, as a journalist to now publishing your first book? Um, I think like, 
I think, yeah, my first journalism, um, like the first time I saw my name in print uh, was 2012 when I did a terror uh, terrorizer internship. Um, and I remember at the time, yeah, I was like uh, 18, 19 at the time. Um, I was huge, like, I, <laughs> like, I can't remember, I can't believe they'd like reply to my emails to like, let me on the course. <laughs> like, I remember specifically the email coming through thinking, oh my God, oh my God. Um, I remember at the time thinking like, um, that it was just, you know, like, like amazing. And like, buy, I bought a bunch of copies for people. I, they must've had like a spike in sales that month because I just like, <laughs> <laughs> I I moved recently. I still found one of the like free CDs you got with that with that one. I was like, I don't. I think I can probably get rid of this now. Um, but yeah, I remember feeling like completely ecstatic. Um, and now I'm like now I'm thirty, and um, I um, I it, it's it's a bit because it's such a long process. Um, I am a different person now to. Um, who I was when I started writing the book, like a, a two year thing is quite, but quite a long time. Um, I think at the moment it just feels a bit overwhelming. Like I feel sort of like, yeah, like this, it's, it's obviously huge. Um, I feel really great about it, but yeah, it's, it feels a bit, it, it's not quite real. Like even, you know, I even, I got my author copies through the other day and that's, it still doesn't feel, you're holding it in my hands. It doesn't feel real quite yet. I think when other people, um, have it and can, can read it, I think it will feel a bit more like sink in a bit more, I think. Yeah, hopefully it'll be in my hands soon. Uh, when is the release day? Is it the 17th? Yeah, 17th. Uh, so we got moved back a bit. Um, there have been all kinds of delays in the, um, the printing industry. Um, but yeah, it is uh, coming out on the 17th. Uh, the release party is on the 19th. We are getting um, getting wallowing to um, the UK kind of sludgy, deathy, grindy band wallowing. Um to play in the Water Stones, which is kind of um, the UK equivalent of like a Barnes & Noble or something. Um, so this has got to be the only book release ever with a death metal band playing. Uh, to, I haven't seen another. Um, I haven't seen another in like, I can imagine them playing like a small one, but um, I was thrilled to bits um, when, yeah, when like the Bristol's Waterstones allowed me to have a death metal band. We, um, I managed to get the lasers in, but we had to compromise on the smoke machines. So yeah, no, no. <laughs> hopefully, like when, when the, in the, like whenever, whenever the next like death metal book comes out, hopefully, uh, they they'll um society progress to the point where we can have smoke machines in a bookshop. So also, uh, you're going to have a speaker, right? It's David Burke. Yeah, um, David Burke himself. I'm glad you brought him up. Um, yeah, David Burke. David and I have been friends for quite a while. Um, he's actually one of the first people I went to, um, to uh, when when the book was um. Well, I was sort of planning everything. Um, he and I had spoken a bit because he's also um, also a journalist. Like he's done, done some stuff for similar places to me. We've worked together on um, uh, Astral Noise. Uh, he's also a writer for um, for the Quietus. Um And uh, yeah, he he and I had a real good um, in depth chat about the um, about the existentialism of death metal, which forms quite a big part of the book. Yeah, and so. I started this podcast and my plan, he ruined my plans for this podcast. <laughs> I started it and my plan was, is I was going to do a philosophical breakdown. Like mm -hmm. first I was going to cover like, you know, the basics, you know, what's the meaning <laughs> of life, free will determinism. And then I was going to start doing philosophical breakdowns of, of different bands. And then mm -hmm. I talked to Dave and he's like, yeah, it's all existentialism. I was like, fuck, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do now? <laughs> That, yeah, um, yeah. So I, um, so my background in philosophy is like I did a, um, I did the first year um, of a, a course in it, uh, like at A level. So like, um, so it's like seventeen to eighteen uh, course, in, and and that did the, the the real basics of philosophy. And I did a bit of um, like critical theory at uni because um, I didn't I did an English degree. Um, and I have read, I have sort of read a bit around, I sort of like, I explained my, like, um, my background in philosophy is like enough to understand the good place, um, but not like much more sort of specific than that. Um, and uh, Dave and I had a really, really interesting chat about, um, yeah, about existentialism in death metal and spe specifically why death metal is, um, I was sort of, I mean, obviously I'm interested in, um, 
why death metal has stood around for so long. And um, David, I realized um, through speaking to David um, that a lot of it is because um, it is because death metal discusses death. And um, right. you know, we have <laughs> so much art. Yeah, yeah, astonishingly. Um, and um, that's obviously um, something that's yeah. You know, until we can all download our consciousness into into machines, um, that is something that's something that's going to be um, very very present in. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's the thing that unites everyone. It's um, yep. it's the reason why yeah, it's the reason why we have so much art about death. Um, it's yeah. it's the yeah the only the only guaranteed thing. Um, and yeah, that's why death metal is so. That's one of the reasons why death metal is there, there are no end there's no end of things to, to write about. You don't get tired writing about death in death metal because there are all, there are so many ways to die. There are so many sort of myriad fears around dying from the sort of very tender and human um to the real abstract to um you know, the countless ways you can die amongst the stars as um people like Cryptic Shift are, um are going through. So that was the um that's covered in the first chapter. David's very present in the first chapter, um, talking about like what the kind of philosophical breakdown of death metal is and how it's um, how that um, is expressed really well through death growl and yeah, and and that's that's the sort of it's that energy which is the sort of stay which yeah forms the backbone of like the staying power of death metal. Well, unfortunately, Zoom's about to cut out us, uh, okay. cut out on us because of. I don't have the pro edition. I, you know, I could talk to you about this forever. I feel like, <laughs> but I, I can't wait to read the book. I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's November the 17th and mm -hmm. where can people get it? Sure. Um, so, uh, I think any of the big bookstores, uh, so, um, I guess like Barnes and Noble, uh, Blackwell's in the UK, Waterstones in the UK, Amazon everywhere. Um, obviously that's the that, <laughs> Amazon controls everything. Um, yeah yeah uh, so yeah any any of the big bookstores um if you have a small bookstore if you please please do speak to them nicely and yeah. maybe they'll maybe they'll stock i'm it. sure they can order it for you yep yeah, yeah. and yeah. and i yeah. will put links in the description to this so I, I really appreciate you talking to me about it and hopefully we'll be able to chat again relatively Definitely. soon about your next Definitely. one and uh november the 17th death metal by tom mm -hmm. coles everybody go out and get it thank you so much Thanks, man.